May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. An Episcopal priest by the name of Fleming Rutledge once wrote the following in a magazine article for the Christian Century. It goes like this. The premier personage of Advent is John the Baptist. When he appears on the banks of the Jordan, the cover-ups come to their appointed end. And then she goes on to say, there are cover-ups of all sorts. Families that will not acknowledge the alcoholism that is destroying them. People who are making their loved ones miserable, but will not go to a therapist. Business partners who cover up for each other. Advent is the season of the uncovering. End of quote. Well... He's back and is always right on time. Second Sunday of Advent. John the Baptist, the voice in the wilderness, complete with his camel hair wardrobe. Old locust breath himself. The question is, are we any more ready for him this year than we have been in years past? Probably not. It's pretty hard to be ready for a guy like John the Baptist. In any event, Robin Griffith Jones once wrote a book entitled The Four Witnesses. Its focus is on the four evangelists who wrote the Gospels we have in the New Testament. The author calls the four the rebel, the rabbi, the chronicler, and the mystic. Luke, as you may have guessed, is the one he names the chronicler. And we can see why in that Luke takes great pains in establishing that Jesus and his followers who comprise his church are very much grounded in history, specifically in the history of the people of Israel. Luke addressed both his gospel and the book of Acts to one he names Theophilus. And in his writing, he attempts to address the concerns, as he perceives them, of the well-to-do Gentile elite within the Greco-Roman culture. He wants to assure his audience that Christianity is not to be seen in any way as a threat to them, that instead it is deeply rooted in Judaism, a religion which the Greek Roman world in the main did not really understand, let alone practice, but one they tended to tolerate, even respect, because among other things, it had a long tradition. It was a known quantity, something they were used to having around, a stable, non-threatening presence in their lives. Luke has a number of agendas in his gospel one of which is to make the case that Christianity is really just a natural fulfillment of Judaism. That is why Luke tells the story of the good news of Jesus, much like an historian or chronicler would, grounding the story in history. Or at least that is what many scholars would argue. Be that as it may, it is very much within an historical context that Luke the Chronicler introduces the reader to John the Baptist. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Now it is important for us to remember that when we come across the word wilderness, excuse me, sometimes translated desert, we should understand this as meaning not just a physical location, but as a place where God forms, and if necessary, reforms his people. As you will recall, the Hebrews were formed as God's people 
in the wilderness after they were delivered out of Egypt. John the Baptist, John the Baptist very much felt that God's chosen people needed to be reformed and the place that needed to happen was in the wilderness. Perhaps that is why he did not hold John the Baptist crusades in Jerusalem and other cities. If you're going to be reformed, you need to go to the wilderness. And so the people came out from Jerusalem and other places to experience his baptism of repentance, as Luke puts it. Repentance. <laughs> now that's a concept we kind of tend to dance around or gloss over. But the truth is, if we want to understand John the Baptist, indeed if we want to understand Jesus, we must come to terms with their call for repentance. One of the hallmarks of their preaching was, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. As we know, the Greek word for repent is metanoia, which means having a change of mind, a change of outlook, a whole new reorientation to how one goes about not only seeing life, but living life. New Testament scholar Luke Timothy Johnson says that it conveys the Hebrew word teshuva, which means turn back. John wanted his audience to turn around and go back to where they were spiritually when God first formed them. Over the years, they had become polluted with the ways of the world. To get back to where they once belonged, as Sir Paul McCartney might put it, they needed to be reoriented in and to the ways of God. Their minds needed to be changed, and their lives needed to be changed. And we're not talking about a little tweaking here and there. We are talking about a radical change. As much as Luke may have wanted to present Christianity as non-threatening, the fact remains it was and is very much intended to be a threat to the status quo. Both Jesus and his forerunner, John the Baptist, were looking for nothing less than turning the world upside down. But not through a revolution via some worldly political movement. Instead, it would happen through an ever-expanding community of people who had repented and who had experienced their own lives turned upside down. I don't know about you, but I think that is why I am never quite ready for John the Baptist and his message of repentance. You see, I'm not sure that I really want to be radically changed. I know I'm not particularly eager to have my world turned upside down. <laughs> I guess I just really have trouble accepting the notion that I need some sort of complete overhaul. Now, it is not that I believe that I am perfect, far from it, actually. There is definitely some room for improvement, but wouldn't a little tweaking here and there do the trick? You know, a little buffing of the rough spots, a little purity polish, if you will, to brighten up some of the darker areas of who I am. So yes, I could stand to do a little more of this and a little less of that, but really, I'm a pretty good guy. The demand may be for repentance, but I'm not sure anything all that drastic is called for. Is it? Or am I only fooling myself? If we believe that we are living in a fallen world, if we believe that our present reality falls far short of what we imagine the kingdom of God must be like, 
then how come I don't feel all that uncomfortable living in it? Why does it seem to be, at least most of the time, such a comfortable fit, almost like an old shoe? Perhaps I do need a little more than just a little tweaking here and there. Maybe there are things about myself that I am blind to, things that I have kept covered up even from myself. Fleming Rutledge reminds us that Advent is a time for uncovering. Maybe it is a good time for me to take an honest spiritual inventory and determine if there are some things I need to uncover in order that the they may be exposed to and cleansed by the light of Christ. Maybe I need to take a journey to my own wilderness where I can be reformed in Christ. Maybe I need to stop dancing around and glossing over this whole idea of repentance. And maybe, just maybe, I am not alone in that. Tough things to ponder. But such pondering is necessary, I believe, if we are to take seriously the challenging invitation of this holy season to prepare the way of the Lord. Luke, quoting the prophet Isaiah, proclaims, Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. What astoundingly good news. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. And there is no statute of limitation on this prophecy. The Lord who brings the salvation of God to all flesh is always on his way, always coming to those who prepare a way for him and make room for him in their hearts. But if we are to prepare, truly prepare, then we must stop dancing around and glossing over our need for repentance. The gospel is pretty clear about that.